question, why small fruits, right? And, and really, I want us to direct our, our thoughts as why small fruits as opposed to the other type of fruits that generally grow on trees, right? So some uh, benefits of small fruits, obviously less space is required. So, you know, if you have a, uh, a small landscape, uh, you can better accommodate small fruits. Uh, they come into production much sooner. Uh, usually one or two years, you start to see production on small fruits. Uh, you may see that on tree fruits as well, but usually they don't, they don't come into for full production uh, for many years thereafter, right? Uh, a lot of our small fruits need very few pesticides. That's always a benefit, uh, no matter where we're gardening, but especially if we're gardening uh, around the home, right? So uh, there are a few pests, a few that are pretty gnarly. Uh, we'll talk about those, but generally fewer pesticides needed. Um, uh, in terms of, of using fruits around the home, small fruits can oftentimes be incorporated uh, into the landscape uh, as landscape, uh, you know, as uh, uh, hedges, as uh, screens, uh, those types of things. So that's beneficial. And of course, you know, we all like the fresh uh, picked uh, flavor, the quality uh, that we can get from growing our own fruit. So tonight I'm gonna to talk uh, mostly about the main small fruits that, that people grow. Uh, that doesn't mean there's not other ones, there certainly are, um, but uh, you know, we're, we're time limited. So we'll talk about strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, and finally a little bit about grapes. So small fruits are called small fruits. And I guess I may have alluded to this uh, before, not because the size of the fruit but because, because of the size of the plant, right? The plants are usually smaller in stature than are the tree fruits. So we'll start off and talk a little bit about strawberries, right? Strawberries, I think, are, are one of the easiest small fruits to grow. Um, if we think about uh, soil preparation, uh, strawberries like well-drained soils, loamy soils, um, really uh, uh, drainage is a must. You know, last time we talked about how to uh, check for drainage, you dig a hole, you fill it up with water and you see how long it takes that water to vacate the hole, right? So that's usually about a 12 inch deep hole. And if that water vacates in one to two days and generally your drainage is, is pretty good, right? If it doesn't, then you might need to think about building some type of raised structure, you know, raised beds or just uh, you know, in landscape terms, we call a berm. You know, we, we raise, pile up some soil a little bit higher than the uh, elevation, and, and that will increase our drainage uh, to our plants. Um, strawberries are probably uh, also one of the most short-lived plants uh, that we'll talk about, right? So usually uh, we renovate strawberry beds uh, after three or four years. Uh, they're usually starting to decline about then. They're susceptible to some soil-borne uh, diseases. Uh, and so if you remember last time, that makes strawberries a very, very good candidate for crop rotation, right? So uh, verticillium wilt uh, is uh, one disease that's very prominent. Um, so if you do crop rotation with strawberries, don't follow the strawberries with solanaceous plants. So tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers, and of course not previous uh, strawberries. You know, if, if you don't have room uh, to do that, then maybe just grow like uh, a cover crop or fescue for a few years uh, to decrease the incidence of your diseases uh, for strawberries in that area. So, you know, a lot of these uh, small fruits uh, we may order from uh, mail order companies. Uh, you know, a, a lot of them are going to be available at um, you know, home stores, at nurseries, as potted plants. Uh, but generally, the cultivar selection and the price is off, often better if we order them uh, from mail order companies. And when, they're, when they arrive, these aren't strawberries, they're uh, probably blackberries or something like that here. But um, when they arrive, they come bare root uh, and they're usually, you know, packed in plastic. So, what we want to do when we get them is, is certainly to inspect them, make sure that the, that the order is correct. Uh, and then if we can't plant them right away, we need to make sure that we care for them properly, right? So uh, 
if they come, you know, packaged like this, we can kind of fold that plastic back over them. It doesn't need to be airtight, but you know, it needs to be fairly snug around the plants and then put them in a cool place. That might be, you know, an unheated garage. Uh, if you got room, it might be a refrigerator, protect them from, from freezing, but also protect them from warm temperatures. You don't really want them to start sprouting before you get them in the ground. So another option, and this might even be a preferred option, is that you can heal these plants in. So basically, you know, if, if your soil is uh, amenable, you can go out and dig a trench uh, in your garden and uh, you don't have to place the plants in the soil, just put the whole bundle of plants in the soil and then pull uh, loose soil back up over the root system. Uh, that will protect those roots. Uh, generally, it's uh, temperatures are gonna be fairly cool uh, and that will uh, keep those plants until you're ready to, uh, to plant them. So that's gonna go with any of the small fruits that we're talking about tonight. So a little bit about planting strawberries. So uh, spring is, is the best. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're getting into about the right time now to be planting strawberries. We generally avoid fall planting because strawberries are susceptible to heaving when we have cycles of freezing and thawing of the soil. So the soil expands and contracts and it can actually push that young plant up out of the soil. So do it in the spring when, when you know, the, the dangers of that happening with the soil, soil has passed. Strawberries have extensive roots, uh, you know, keep them moist before planting. Some people will even soak strawberries in water for a few hours before they plant them. I, I don't know that that's altogether necessary. Uh, if I was going to err on the side, I would say don't soak as opposed to soaking them too long. You know, if you, if you start the soaking process and you forget about it and leave them in there a couple of days, it, it's not good for the plants. So if, if you can soak them for a few hours, that's certainly fine, soak the root systems, but uh, I, I don't think that's all that necessary, especially if you water them in after planting. So you wanna ensure that the crown of the plant is at soil level. So in this uh, diagram here, that first plant is uh, at the proper depth. So here's the crown. And so it's right at the soil level, right? So this plant's obviously too deep and this plant is too shallow where the roots are exposed. So this would be what you might expect from uh, heaving uh, if you plant you know, in the winter uh, where the soil can, can push the plant up out of the, out of the ground. And if that happens, you really need to, to replant those plants as soon as possible to prevent them from drying out. So our initial spacing on strawberries is usually about two feet apart. So um, we're not interested in getting a crop of strawberries the first year, right? So in, in fact, uh, I'll tell you later, it's best to pull off any blooms that come the first year and force that plant to dedicate its resources to growing vegetatively because strawberries, put out runners, they put out lateral stems with little plants on them. And so even though we're only planting them two feet apart, by the end of that first growing season, uh, the strawberry plants are gonna be thick. Uh, you know, they're, they're basically will, will expand to the area that you have allotted for them to grow. So planting strawberries, you know, we said that raised beds are really good. A, a lot of people like to have these pyramid type beds. You can actually get a few more plants uh, in uh, your kind of footprint of space because you're uh, including a third dimension, you know, an, an, an upright dimension where, where plants can, can space themselves. Uh, on the left is typical of strawberries. We call this a matted row. So, you know, the, uh, if this were, say, the fall of the year, then we might have just had strawberries planted two feet apart here. And through the spring and summer, they would have filled that space with plantlets. And I want you to also notice this uh, wire mesh over the plants, right? So strawberries more than any of the other plants that we talk about tonight are gonna be susceptible to freezing temperatures in the spring. They're flowers, uh, they flower early, sometimes you know, very early April, and uh, they can get killed by frost. So it's nice to have you know, a structure like this to pull a blanket over or a tarp or a piece of plastic 
when you expect those freezes, right? You just need to remember to pull it off uh, when the sun, sun comes out again. And uh, we, we, you, if you check yes on your, uh, your uh, chat box there about the uh, uh, wildlife talk coming up, we won't need to talk about this, but strawberries are also very attractive to birds and squirrels and chipmunks. So if you have a structure, you can easily put screening over the plants or wire mesh to keep those unwanted animals out. And you know, if, if you just want a few strawberries, you could grow them in containers very easily. There's, there's containers specifically designed with holes in the sides or, or in this case where you can layer containers one on top of the other uh, just for growing strawberries. Some, some of our greenhouse growers will grow strawberries in long plastic sleeves that are full of growing medium and they just poke holes in that sleeve and grow strawberries there. So they're very versatile in terms of the way we can plant them and grow them. So some recommended varieties, uh, you, you have this, so I'm not gonna go through all of these. I, I really just want to uh, recognize Early Glow. Um, we have a fruit specialist who just retired, uh, many of you know him, John Strang. And for years, John has done strawberry variety trials. And every year he has people come in and taste the different varieties. And every year without fail, Early Glow, which is not a new variety, is one of the uh, best tasting, rated best tasting varieties out there. Now, you'll notice you've got early, mid-season, and late varieties. It's always nice to mix those, mix those up to extend your harvest a little bit on strawberries. So a little bit more about strawberry care, right? So uh, as I said earlier, remove the blooms the first season, have the plant dedicated to vegetative growth. Uh, the runners are produced. Here you can see some newly planted plants, these runners coming out. Uh, they can even come out when you've got fruit on them. Remember, if this is new plants, we really like to see that fruit pulled off. In fact, you know, here you've got a couple of fruit. You don't see as many runners, right? Here, no fruit. A lot of healthy runners coming out. So the strawberries will then eventually form this matted row, uh, which is what you're looking for. Um, really uh, late summer, uh, you're, you're looking for strawberries that the plantlets to be about uh, on six inch centers, so about six inches between each plant. So that's a good spacing. You can go in and thin things out. That's not a problem at all. Um, and then uh, the next spring, uh, you know, after fruiting and just as the, uh, the runners are starting to be produced, you come in and you thin out these rows. You can cut this back to like six inches apart. You know, just use a hoe or something. Some people will use a lawnmower to go through and, and do this, although a lawnmower won't get to the crown of the plants. But just leave a six inch uh, row here and then that will allow future uh, runners, future stolons to come out and populate that area again. And a good idea is, you know, say this year, if you leave a six inch uh, row in the middle of the bed, then next year, maybe move that to the side of the bed and maybe the next year, move it to the other side of the bed, right? Move that row around uh, in, in future years. So another good thing, so if you're, uh, if you're in, in late summer and fall, if you're thinning out the beds a little bit to make them a little bit more open, it's also a great time to apply some mulch. Uh, studies have shown that mulch strawberries produce more and larger strawberries than unmulched strawberries. So, you know, here we see uh, hay in the row middles. You could use leaves. You know, some type of organic mulch is really good. So any questions on strawberries before we move on yes sir we got a couple questions hold on just a second here let's see can you use row covers over the strawberry wires for frost protection absolutely uh, row covers are really good uh, especially if they're porous because then you're not so concerned if it you know the sun comes out the next day and it he heats up real quickly uh, if you're using something that's non-porous then you need to get out you know fairly early in the morning and, and get those uh, the, the covers off. Okay, next question. Is it necessary to thin the strawberry in raised beds? 
can the strawberry plants get too thick? So uh, you will still get uh, production with thick strawberries, uh, but your quality is diminished. And, and by quality, I mean, you may get a lot of small berries, right? You won't get as many big berries. So uh, it is possible to get berries from thick plants for sure, uh, but it, it's really a better practice to thin them out a little bit. Okay. How many years can you grow strawberries in the same bed? Well, it, it just kind of depends. Um, uh, I, I would say research your varieties. Uh, some of them may have more disease resistance than others. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about disease incidents, we have three things that go on. We have to have a susceptible variety, we have to have favorable environmental conditions, favorable weather, and then we have to have the disease, right? So if you're lucky enough to never get the disease to inoculate your berries, you can grow berries in a long, for a long time. But now you do need to practice this uh, deal of thinning them out quite often. So you, you can grow them for quite a while, but it's just standard practice is to uh, try to, try to uh, rejuvenate them or replace them every few years. All right, got one more. Any thoughts on uh, day neutral or ever bearing strawberries? Okay, so what I've talked about are June, what we call June bearing strawberries, right? Um, day neutral uh, strawberries have the potential to bear fruit longer but they're also very susceptible to hot weather. So in Kentucky, we don't really uh, see much benefit to day neutral strawberries. I think they're more uh, beneficial to more Northern climates where you have a more extended you know, spring or, or not as hot of a summer. Okay, got one more popped up. Okay. Uh, if, let's see, if you have berries in a chair that are terraced, bed 24 inches wide, what do you recommend for the alternating in the beds? I mean, the plant spacings. So I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Talking about other plants in the bed or, so you got a, a bed that's 24 inches wide Crop, oh, sorry, sorry. It, it was crop rotation after a few years. I, I guess oh, okay, it, so, well, you could, uh, you could grow uh, other vegetables other than solanaceous plants. So just stay away from those, uh, uh, you know, tomatoes and peppers. You could grow uh, legumes like beans would be good. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, some of the coal crops uh, would be good like uh, cabbage and broccoli, those sorts of things, so corn if, if you got a big enough space brad did that get your question you can put it in the chat yes or no um other than that we are good on questions right now okay good well we'll move to blackberries right so and some of the information here i'm, I'm treating blackberries and raspberries separately uh, but some of this information is going to be the same like the the planting and, and kind of general care. Uh, it's just when we get to pruning and things that they're a little bit different. So with blackberries, we have three basic growth habits of blackberries. And you can see them illustrated there. We have erect, semi-erect, and trailing, right? So I'm not gonna talk very much about trailing other than when we get to the cultivars, there are a couple of cultivars of trailing on the list but you'll see that they're listed as not cold hardy, right? So trailing blackberries are marginally hardy here. It, it's the stems. The stems can get damaged uh, with winter temperatures that go below about five degrees or so. So um, yeah, and we can easily get temperatures that cold in the winter here, right? But semi-erect and erect uh, uh, do much better. And so besides the stature of these plants, we also have uh, cultivars that are thorny or thornless, right? And so uh, a lot of people like thornless because they're easier to pick, easier to manage. Uh, 
My understanding is that thorny varieties tend to have a little bit better uh, flavor. So the thing about blackberries and raspberries is that the growth on these plants is biannual. It lives for two years. Now the plants themselves are perennial. The crown lives, you know, many years, uh, but the, the shoots that come up live for two years. So the first year's growth is vegetative. It doesn't flower. Uh, and uh, it's been termed a primocane. So that first year prime, primocane. So no flowers and no fruit. So the second year that primocane transitions into a fluorocane. Fluorocane then flowers and fruits and then it dies at the end of the season. Right. So, but at any given time in your black blackberry patch, you're going to have a mixture of primocanes and fluorocanes, right? Primocanes, no fruit and flower. Fluorocanes is where this year's uh, fruit is going to be produced. Now, to muddy the waters a little bit more, uh, in the last uh, few decades or so, and really in the last one decade with regard to blackberries, research, researchers have produced cultivars that are called primocane bearing, right? So they, they didn't read the book. They decided the first year I'm gonna flower and fruit, right? So they flower and fruit on primocanes, but they're still biennial. That primocane still lives for another year and they will produce fruit again the second year when it, you know, it, it's then, it, we still call it a floral cane. So we call these primocane bearings, strawberries or blackberries, or ever bearing or fall bearing, because when they produce on that first year's wood, it's usually in late summer or fall. Now, uh, just to get ahead of myself a little bit, the, the first year's fruit is generally far superior to the second year's fruit, right? So because it's being produced you know, late summer and fall, a, a cooler time of the year, we get cooler nights to concentrate those sugars. So a lot of people really like these primocane uh, brambles. Brambles is the general word for blackberries and, and strawberries. Or, I'm sorry, blackberries and raspberries. They really like these primocane uh, types because they produce really good fruit. And sometimes people just grow them for that first year's fruit and then they mow them down. So the next spring, new shoots come up, they, they bear on those fruits, uh, shoots at the end of the season, and they mow them down, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about pruning here. But so here's, uh, you know, what you might see in a, a typical, uh, you know, berry patch. Uh, these, uh, some people call them cane berries, uh, brambles. So, the first, going from uh, right to left, the first shoots here would be primocanes, right? That primocane, uh, through the season, it starts to produce lateral shoots, unless it's a red raspberry, and then it doesn't produce any lateral shoots. So everything else produces lateral shoots, continues to grow up, produce lateral shoots, uh, and then, uh, the next year it's going to become a floral cane. So where most of the uh, berries are produced, the best berries are produced down here at the bottom of these lateral shoots. Okay. So remember that because that's going to dictate how we prune these, right? The best berries are produced at the base of lateral shoots. And these tips here, Sometimes we remove the tips so that it makes those lateral shoots stronger. Okay, so here's some cultivars. Uh, you know, we've got uh, uh, erect thorny, uh, erect uh, thornless, semi-erect thorn, thornless, trailing. So again, I said trailing. There's a couple of varieties here, but generally we don't recommend them because they're not hardy in Kentucky. And then, uh, very recently, we've had the production of a couple of primocane fruiting uh, uh, blackberries, prime gem and prime jan. And I just saw a report, and I didn't note what the name of the cultivar was. So 
both of these primocaine fruiting uh, berries are thorny. Uh, I think there's uh, just recently released a thornless primocaine fruiting blackberry, but I have no experience uh, with it. I haven't, uh, I don't know much about it. So planting these plants, and this goes for blackberries and raspberries. Um, we can plant them in the fall. Uh, most of them are, are hardy enough to, to do that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, usually uh, spring is preferred. So if you're planting uh, dormant plants, you can certainly plant them in the fall or uh, you know, early spring. If you're planting actively growing plants, like you've gone to a nursery and you're getting blackberry plants that are growing in a pot, they have leaves on them. It's best to wait until the danger of frost is passed to put them in your landscape because uh, if you put them out too early, they could get damaged by, by low temperatures, right? So the fact that they're growing means their hardiness has uh, decreased for the year. Uh, so with uh, blackberries and raspberries, you can actually plant them a little bit deeper uh, than they were previously growing in the nursery. Uh, that's beneficial. Uh, that they're one of the few plants that we'll talk about where you don't plant them at the same depth they were previously growing. So that's our general rule in horticulture. You plant things at the depth that was previously growing. But with blackberries, raspberries, and tomatoes, if I didn't mention it last week, you can sink those plants down into the ground a little bit deeper. So mulching, beneficial after planting, and usually you're gonna space these about two to three feet apart, right? They're, they're gonna spread over time, so they'll fill in the, fill in the areas. Okay, so we'll talk uh, about two different blackberries in terms of pruning. We'll talk about erect blackberries, and then we'll talk about semi-erect blackberries. So erect blackberries generally do not have to be trellised, right? They produce a very uh, sturdy stem. By the name, uh, they're erect, they grow upright. Uh, so basically, uh, let's just walk through this. The first season, you've got primocanes coming up, right? New growth. Um, you want that to get about 30 to 36 inches tall, and then you break the tip out of it, right? So uh, that's gonna produce more uh, uh, lateral growth that's stronger. Remember, that's where the, the desired fruit is gonna be produced. Uh, if you've got a lot of suckers coming up at this time, you can uh, weed those out as well. So that's the first season. Now, uh, re realize, let's not call this the first season. Let's call this the first growth. So this is the, this is the primocane growth. So the second season, now we've got primocanes. You know, last year's primocanes have now become fluorocanes, and we've got new primocanes coming up, right? So it's going to be more complex. So first thing, if we see any uh, disease canes, any insect infested canes, again, we'll talk about a, a, the redneck cane borer, which is a problem in, in a minute, but we wanna thin those out first. That's our first decision to get rid of, you know, stuff that doesn't look good. Um, then we're gonna look at those floral canes and we're gonna thin them out to about five to six canes per foot of row, okay? so so. If you only have a single row of canes, that's too many. But usually you've got a row that's maybe 12 inches or 18 inches wide, right? So then you can tolerate five to six canes per foot of row, right? So these are the plants that we topped last year. So now we're gonna cut those lateral branches back to 12 inches, right? So look at the illustration down here at the bottom. So this is, so here, these have been topped. So these were topped. This is the, the end of the first season's growth. So the beginning of the second season, we're cutting off these lateral branches, right? To about 12 inches, maybe 18 inches. So any new primocanes coming up, we have to prepare them for next year by topping them, you know, about uh, 36 inches, right? And then the third thing we have to do is anything that's not got leaves on it, get it out. That's what fruited last year, right? So it, remember it only lives two years, it's not gonna grow anymore, so prune those out. So and again, with these plants, 
very, very uh, strong, uh, rigid growth. No trellising uh, is required for these. And a little bit about uh, blackberry flowering. So blackberries, you have a, uh, a primary uh, inflorescence, primary flower, and then you have secondary and tertiary inflorescences, right? So uh, blackberries generally flower, uh, oh, end of May, 1st of June, right? So in, in Kentucky growing up, I know we always had what we call blackberry winter, right? That's when uh, it got cold when the blackberries were flowering and you hoped it didn't frost because that would kill your flowers, right? But the good thing is you're only killing these flowers that are open. So very rarely do you have a complete loss in blackberries because of frost. There's more likely a complete loss if you have extreme winter temperatures that drop down to, you know, minus 10, minus uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, that can kill the uh, whole above ground part of the plant. But very rarely do you have uh, damage just from frost. So that's kind of how they bloom. Now I said uh, one, one pest that we have to look out for is redneck cane borer. So this is a pest that we control uh, at the pruning cycle. So here's, here's the insect here. Uh, it's larvae tunnels inside the cane of the, the berries, the blackberries and raspberries. So it produces, you know, something that looks like this. And so these canes are still alive, but they're compromised, right? They're not going to produce nearly as much fruit, nearly as good a quality fruit. So if you see canes that have these uh, swelling in them when you're pruning you always prune those first and get them out right that's your first decision well you can prune out the dead stuff but prune out these that have redneck cane borer and get them out of the uh, patch and and so get them out get them out to bury them deep or burn them or put them in the trash right get them out of the where things are growing um, so the other type is uh, semi-erect blackberries, right? And so, and we're talking about thornless, really thorn, thornless and thorny would be about the same. Um, but uh, so these need a trellis, right? So they're much more vigorous than erect blackberries. See the, the size of these, right? They're, they're huge plants, huge lateral branches here, right? And so here's uh, one way that you can trellis these. It's called a double T. So you got a post here uh, with a lateral board here, a larger lateral board here. And then it's hard to see here, but you've got a wire running here. It's gonna connect to the next post with the same type of, of uh, boards, a wire here, and then a wire here, and a wire here. So that produces kind of a funnel, right? Where the blackberries can grow up, um, and, you know, if you get stray canes, you can easily uh, reposition them uh, when they're young, right? So that's a lot easier than pounding a tobacco stick next to each blackberry and tying it up with a string, right? That'll work too, but it's much better to have a trellis system. So this is the double T four wire trellis. Uh, the bottom wires are about two feet apart. The top wires are about four feet apart, right? Uh, so this is about uh, two and a half to three feet off the ground. This is about five feet off the ground. So the way we prune these then, uh, so the first year of growth, these are gonna be tip pruned above the upper trellis, right? So about a foot above the upper trellis. So that makes them about six feet tall. Remember on the erect ones, we're, we're tip pruning them at three feet, right? So these are twice as vigorous, right? Uh, any dead fruiting canes, we're gonna uh, chop out and remove. Uh, then uh, the dormant season, these, you know, last year's primal canes, we're gonna remove a third to a fourth uh, of the total fruiting canes, uh, the ones that are, uh, you know, rated fruit this year. And then we're gonna, bring those lateral branches back to about 18 inches, right? So here's what uh, 
a plant would look like. So these are all uh, floral canes, second year growth, right? When things start growing, we'll get new primal canes coming up. Uh, but look, see, these are, are you know, at least uh, a foot above the wire here. And these big lateral branches, I mean, you might have to have a ladder to pick some of these blackberries, right? They're going to be produced all along the stem here on these lateral branches is where the fruit's going to be produced. So just a review. So the first year of growth, it's a primocane, right? We tip prune it in the, in the summer. Depending on the, the vigor of it, we might tip prune it about three feet or six feet, right? And we're going to prune back the lateral branches to about 12 inches or maybe 18 inches uh, if it's a semi-erect uh, variety. Then the second year, um, we're going to uh, thin out the row, uh, leave about four to five plants per row, eliminate those that have redneck cane borer, um, uh, and then uh, uh, repeat the, the primal cane pruning as in the first year. So uh, top them, uh, you know, about a, a foot above the, the trellis. Now we'll talk a little bit about fall bearing blackberries, right? So these are the ones that produce on the primo cane. So we can grow plants as usual. We can plant them as usual. Um, uh, you know, the crown and root are perennial. Um, so the plants are allowed to grow and fruit the first year. So important here is that the fruit is produced on the tips of the canes, not on the lateral branches. So you don't do any tip pruning if you want to have first year fruit on these. So the following year, you can thin the planting, you can remove the tip uh, where it was, uh, and those lateral branches will produce a fruit that second year, okay? Or you can cut them to the ground after the first year and they'll produce just that, that fall crop. Okay, so that's your kind of your, your uh, options there. Let me go on through raspberries and then we'll, we'll stop for um, questions. But raspberries, here's, here's varieties. Raspberries are, are uh, very hardy. Uh, we have some fall bearing red and yellow black uh, raspberries and then we have June bearing red, black, and purple raspberries. Right. So June bearing raspberries. So these are raspberries that bloom on floral canes, second year growth, right? And, and these are also generally red raspberries that follow this, this uh, this uh, menu here. So we don't tip prune them because red raspberries don't produce uh, side branches to any extent. So the spring will go in and remove any uh, plants that bloomed last year, the dead floral plant canes. Uh, we're gonna narrow the width of the low row a little bit because uh, raspberries really like to put up suckers uh, around the edge. Um, We'll leave four to five good diameter canes per linear foot of row. Remember to call out things that have redneck cane borer. Um, and if there's any uh, tall canes, uh, we'll cut them back to about five uh, inches to remove any uh, winter damage. And in the summer, usually we just go along and do a mowing to remove any of the uh, suckers that are coming up from uh, the root system out, out into the rows. Now, uh, fall bearing red and yellow blackberries. So this is kind of like the fall bearing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, red and yellow raspberries are kind of like the fall bearing blackberries, right? So the fruit, the first fruit is produced up at the top of the primal cane. Right, so here's uh, growth, produce fruits, 
Then the second season, um, these lower shoots, side shoots are going to produce uh, the the second uh, season's uh, fruit from the floral cane. So again, two choices. If you just only want fall production, um, you have you know the the primal canes produce like here, and then you mow these to the ground in early spring and get rid of all the existing growth. Right, you're not worried about that second uh, growth. If you want both fall and spring production, then in the spring you remove these tips here. They're going to die. There's where that's where the fruit was produced uh, last fall. Uh, then the canes to three to four, the largest ones in the row, and then the spring crop will be on from the laterals of the canes, right? Uh, so what it's my understanding that the fall production is much, much superior in Kentucky than the spring production, right? So you can trellis uh, raspberries. Um, you know, just a, a simple trellis is usually good. They're not as near, nearly as tall as blackberries. Uh, as you see, they also don't produce as many uh, lateral uh, shoots. And so this just shows uh, some uh, fall bearing red raspberries. It's hard to see, but the fruits are up here on the tips of the branches, right? And then the following spring, you just go through and remove this whole hedgerow of plants, and then new primal canes would come up that would produce uh, fruit in, in that fall. So uh, a really nasty um, insect that we have with small fruits, and it's not been with us uh, extremely long, uh, probably about 10 years or so, is the spotted wing Drosophila. So Drosophila, it's a fly. And uh, if you know what the larvae of flies are, they're maggots, right? And so these maggots, uh, the flies lay eggs on these soft uh, fruits. Here's a fly here. And then the maggots hatch and they bore into the fruit. And so actually, if you don't know they're there, it's not a big deal. But when the flies are getting ready to emerge, the maggots will come out of the fruit. And then it does become a big deal, right? Because then you see them. So we're showing strawberry down here. In Kentucky, we don't see uh, a spotted ring Drosophila very much with strawberries. Uh, usually uh, they haven't uh, emerged uh, in time to lay eggs in strawberries, but we do see them in blackberries and raspberries a lot, right? So uh, pretty much widespread across the state. Um, so some uh, insecticides that you can use here are malathion, seven uh, are available to, to homeowners, uh, but it, it's really difficult to keep a, a residue of chemicals on the fruit so that, you know, the ovipositing, the, the egg laying uh, flies uh, are disrupted, right? So it, they're really, it's, it's a, uh, a pretty uh, big problem here. Uh, this spotted wing Drosophila. So any, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry to leave uh, brambles on that note, but we can uh, uh, talk about a few questions here if you got some. Yes, sir. Uh, can you cut prima canes down in the fall and get new canes the following year? Uh, you can, but they're going to be prima canes. So I, I think the question is, well, I don't know what the question is, but, but yeah, so that's, that's the basis of uh, these fall bearing uh, raspberries and blackberries is that they produce fruit on the primal cane, then you cut them down. Uh, you can cut them down in the fall, you can cut them down in the spring, just cut them down before the plants would start to grow again, because that's when the new primal canes are going to come up in the spring. Good deal. 
Next question. We currently have several mature blackberry brambles that we need to transplant to other locations. Is there anything we need to know when we get or when we go to dig these up and move them? So um, if they're semi-erect blackberries and you have uh, stems that are reaching the ground, you will find, so the stems basically reach the ground and they actually penetrate the ground. They have a specialized tip. They penetrate the ground, they will root, and the following spring, you'll get shoots from those. It's called tip layering. That's one of the easiest ways to propagate uh, blackberries and raspberries. If, if you have uh, uh, erect, blackberries, you would need to have some long lateral shoots low down that would hit the ground uh, to do that. Uh, otherwise, you could dig up the crowns. That's not a problem and, and move them. Um, the, I would think that one of the best times to move them would be the fall of the year. Uh, and the second best time would be uh, early spring. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hold on just a second, Doc. I'm, my screen moved. For raspberries, what's the best approach to controlling weeds within the raspberry row? So you can use uh, some weed fabric uh, around those berries. Weed fabric is really good around uh, uh, small fruits. Um, so, you know, I, I would say in the case of the, the cane berries, blackberries and raspberries, space that weed fabric however wide you want your rows to be you know if that's 12 inches 18 inches and then put that weed fabric down right and then mulch where you don't have the weed fabric so that should help uh with the uh, uh weeds as well and that weed fabric should also help with uh excess uh especially raspberries putting up uh, suckers from the root system you you could also you know, as long as you're very careful, um, you could spray uh, with a contact herbicide, uh, you know, away from the plants. Don't, you know, be careful and not get it on the plants. Don't get it on any suckers that are coming up, but that could be an effective way to, to get rid of some of the weeds as well. All right, next question. Will blackberries and raspberries cross pollinate? How uh, far no. apart should they be planted? They will not. And uh, both of these blackberries and raspberries are self fruitful. So you can plant, if you plant one variety, you're good. You don't have to plant multiple varieties for cross pollination. All right. Can a fungicide be used to control rust on raspberries? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not sure which one, but I'll, uh, at the end of the talk, I'm going to show you some resources. So uh, I'll, I'll point you to where you can find that, or I refer you to their county office and they can pull up some publications uh, with that information. Okay. Will the weed fabric eliminate the spread of the crowns? And I'm assuming that's with raspberries. Uh, so I think you want to space the weed fabric away from your plants a bit because you want some uh, expansion of the crown, which is really um, you want some uh, suckering from the root system and underground stems to kind of fill in your row. But at the same time, you know, you, you want it to be managed. So I would say put the weed fabric uh, a foot to a foot and a half. Uh, well, I would, I would put the weed fabric, say a half to a foot away from on either side of the, the plants. That way you've got some space for the plants to naturally spread out. All right. I have always heard that black raspberries and red raspberries should not be planted near each other. Is this true or false? Uh, I think that's false. I don't know of any reason for that to be true. 
I think that's it, Doc. I'll go okay, back and make good. sure, but I'm pretty sure I got them all. Well, we'll get pl keep plugging along here. We got blueberries next. So blueberries, um, you know, probably all of us know blueberries are acid-loving plants, right? So most of our um, vegetables and fruit species, we do a soil test. It comes back, and the recommendation is going to be to get that uh, soil pH in the slightly acid range, you know, so 6, 6.5 somewhere around there. Blueberries need it a lot more acid, right? So recommendations for blueberries, if, if you, you know, do that soil test and you write blueberry on there as a crop, then the recommendation is going to come back that you need to have that soil pH down lower, 4.5 to around 5 or 5.2. So generally the way we adjust that is with sulfur. Uh, so granular sulfur, elemental sulfur, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, uh, we usually like to, to do kind of a uh, uh, application uh, a few months before we're ready to plant. That way we can do another soil test if we want to and make sure uh, that if we have a lot of, uh, you know, alkalinity in the soil that it's been neutralized and that pH has come down. So that's for, you know, the pre-planting. Then we basically control the pH by using acidifying fertilizers. Ammonium nitrate is, is probably the one that most people use. So the recommendations generally there is to use about a tenth of a pound of ammonium, uh, I'm sorry, ammonium sulfate uh, uh, per plant per year, uh, and then increase that like a tenth of a pound per year for a few years, right? So the first year, it's a tenth of a pound of ammonium sulfate per plant. The second year, it's two tenths of a pound. The third year, it's three tenths of a pound per plant. And then after that, we keep it at three tenths of a pound, right? We don't go over uh, three tenths of a pound unless we're seeing uh, some problems, right? So organic matter also will help to keep the pH low. So things like peat moss, compost, uh, humus, uh, those things uh, somewhat help to lower the pH, but also help to stabilize the pH. So, um, so organic matter is, is really good to incorporate into the soil. And blueberries also like uh, strawberries and blackberries and raspberries prefer well-drained soils. Right, so if you've got well, wet sites, raised beds are probably preferred. But now in the wild, blueberries tolerate wet soils, right? And we really, we have a bunch of plants that are like this. So plants can tolerate wet soils because they have a competitive advantage in doing that, right? So blueberries, tolerate wet soils because a lot of other things don't grow there. So it's, it's an adaptive mechanism, right? But if you have a blueberry growing in wet soils versus a blueberry growing in well-drained soils, the one in well-drained soils is going to perform better. So they just tolerate moisture because, you know, other plants don't, they can compete. Okay. Spring, uh, generally for, uh, is the time for planting. If you get dormant plants uh, early to mid spring, if you got plants that are in containers that have already broken bud, have leaves, maybe even have flowers, uh, then uh, wait till after frost to plant those plants, right? Again, incorporating uh, organic matter or peat in the planting hole is great. Um, and then plant as you would any other plant. Keep the crown of the plant at the soil level. Don't, don't, uh, drop it down like you would blackberries or raspberries. So the top picture, you can see a dormant plant next to a plant that is already budded out, right? So the dormant plant could go in the ground much earlier than the plant budded out. The plant budded out has lost a lot of its dormancy, so it's going to be susceptible to cold temperatures. And then the right, usually blueberries come as multi-stemmed plants. Uh, so where those stems come together, that's the crown. You want to keep that crown above the soil level when you're planting. 
So here's some blueberry varieties. So uh, most of these are what we call high bush blueberries. They're uh, adapted to more northern climates, right? Um, so there's northern high bush blueberries is what we have here. There's southern high bush blueberries, which I don't think are, are very hardy here. And then the third thing that you sometimes see are rabbit eye blueberries. Rabbit eye blueberries can be grown in Kentucky in some of our warmer uh, areas. So, you know, down around the Tennessee border or certainly the western part of the state, uh, rabbit eyes uh, are okay. Uh, but again, I think most of the ones on this list here would be statewide uh, high bush type varieties that would do well across the state. Okay, blueberry pruning. So blueberries are a crop that you can plant and forget and you'll still have blueberries, right? So they're long lived perennial plants. They can live 20 years, 30 years, uh, a long time. But if you don't prune them, so you still get high yields, but you get small berries, tiny berries, right? Um, the older canes become less productive and then you have eventually dead and dying canes after many years that they can spread disease, right? So it's, it's really a benefit to do some pruning uh, with blueberries. You get uh, larger fruit, uh, not as many fruit, but yields are actually the same, but larger uh, berries uh, and healthier plants uh, with pruning. So we like to prune blueberries to develop vigorous plants, vigorous uh, 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 stems, uh, canes that will produce consistently large crops of berries, right? And you can do pruning uh, anytime. You can do it in the fall. Most, most things we say wait till spring to do pruning because uh, a lot of these plants, we may get some winter damage Blueberries, these high bush northern blueberries are extremely hardy. You can prune them in the fall. Don't, don't worry much about the winter damage. And most pruning cuts are what we call thinning out cuts. We have two main types of cuts. And if we were talking about tree fruits, we'd have to talk about this. But uh, so when we're, when we're doing blackberries, we're tipping them or coming in from the sides, those are called heading back cuts. We're leaving part of the stem. With pruning, uh, thinning out cuts, we're removing entire branches. So here's some pictures here, right? Now, this is a, a diagram that shows like pruning the plant, you know, kind of what it looks like over time. Now, I'll tell you that you don't really have to prune a blueberry till it's five years old, right? But if you get in the habit of pruning it, it's going to make it easier to prune later on. And I'll show that uh, in a second here, right? So here's the year one plant. Uh, we might get, and my, so upper left, uh, you, you've got the plant maybe as it comes from the nursery. Uh, it's a good idea to do a little bit of pruning, get out some of the, the tiniest twigs. You know, that that's fine. You're not really doing a whole lot to the architecture of the plant. Three-year-old plant is kind of the same way, you know? on the left is unpruned, on the right is pruned. And you can see we're just kind of opening up the plant, right? Making it less dense. That gets good air movement in, which you know helps with disease issues, gets good sunlight into the plant, which helps with coloration of the berries. And year, by year five, it's kind of the same thing. We're just pruning it out, like keeping, keeping it uh, kind of open. So I'm gonna tell you a little trick uh, to keep up with, with uh, blueberry pruning. So, you know, your, your first decision should be to remove anything that doesn't look right, anything that looks diseased, uh, if it's got an injury to it, if it's got, you know, a canker on it, something like that, then get rid of that. Uh, that's good. Prune it back to the next growing point, uh, the entire branch. Um, remove some of the less vigorous canes, uh, cut them back to ground level. Uh, that'll encourage more shoots to grow out. Um, then remove uh, older shoots so that the bush uh, never has canes that are over five to six years old. Now, hold on, I'm going to show you how to do that. 
and then weak and bushy twigs should be uh, removed as well. So basically on a blueberry, uh, you can remove about 20% of the wood on the bush, 20% of the branches without decreasing any yields, right? So that should tell us how we could methodically go, and go about pruning these blueberry bushes. So consider that you might want to maintain two to three canes that are the same age, right? So you've got two to three canes that are one year old, two to three canes, two year old, same for three year old, same for four year old, same for five year old, right? So you're ending up with 10 to 15 canes on the plant. That's a pretty good number of branches, right? So then I'm at year five. At year six, I'm going to remove the three oldest canes, the three five year old canes, right? And I'm going to allow three new canes to come up, right? So I've always got two to three canes that are one, two, three, four, and five years old, right? So remember, by removing wood, you may be decreasing the number of berries that you produce, but you also increase the size of the berries so you really don't uh, alter the yield uh, at the plant as well. So we said we don't do any uh, heading back much on blueberries. Most people will keep their blueberries at six feet or less just for the ease of uh, picking them. So they get much taller than you know what's uh, manageable. Then you can start bringing back some of those uh, branches. I would still just do cuts back to the next uh, growing point on those. So there shows you know a nice uh, mature plant. It's probably got, you know, 12 to 15 uh, or 10 to 15 uh, branches there. Uh, when you're pruning, you just go in and prune out the oldest three and then do maintenance pruning. Prune out things that may be diseased, damaged, too bushy, too spindly, that sort of thing. So any questions on blueberries? Uh, not on... Yeah. Blueberries. I had one. Sorry, lost my place here. Can you use a material like preen to prevent grass seeds from sprouting into rows of blackberries and raspberries? Uh, I believe so. I would uh, make sure that that the crop that you're applying around is on the label, but uh, I believe you should be able to do that. Yeah, always check the label. Uh, and that's all I've got for right now. Okay, well, grapes is our last topic here. So let's talk about grapes. So uh, we have three main types of grapes that are grown in the United States, right? We have old world grapes, Vitus vinifera. Uh, these are grown uh, for wine. And uh, also the tra table grapes that you get in the stores, uh, the Thompson seedless, the red grapes, the uh, other grapes, those are, are usually Vitus vinifera as well. So those are primarily grown on the West Coast. Um, there are pockets of those grown around. There are people that grow Vitus vinifera in Kentucky, but really uh, Vitus vinifera is not, uh, is, is uh, a little bit uh, not hardy enough for us. It will, it will get uh, winter damage uh, pretty often in Kentucky. So then we have New World grapes. So these originated from uh, North America. Uh, these are things like Concord, right? Uh, Vitus Labrusca. Uh, we use them for grapes, jellies, and jams, not used much for wine. The, uh, the deal is when you use these in wine, they produce some off flavors that generally the, the people who are wine drinkers kind of turn their noses up at, right? And then the third type are muscadine grapes. If you've been in the South, uh, you may have seen muscadine grapes. Uh, they're not hardy in Kentucky, but I just put them in here uh, just for uh, coverage. So here's uh, what these look like. Vitus viniferous generally have uh, huge uh, clusters of berries. Uh, Vitus labruscus generally have uh, smaller clusters, but still sizable clusters, and then Vitus rotundifolia, which is the muscadines, 
uh, have very small clusters, sometimes even just singular grapes uh, on the vine. So what's interesting is that there's been a lot of work to hybridize Vitus vinifera with some of the new world varieties, right? So these are called French American hybrids. That's if they originated in France. If they originated in the United States, they're called American French hybrids, right? So some of these are really good for table grapes uh, and can be used for wine some. A lot of the uh, wineries on the uh, East Coast will use these uh, uh, for wine, but still, you know, some of the wine aficionados still turn their noses up with these uh, French American hybrids. So, so again, the hardiness, the American grapes uh, uh, are the hardiest. Uh, the Europeans are kind of uh, intermediate, and the Muscadines are uh, not hardy. You see them up as far north as Tennessee uh, in some places, but really not into Kentucky. So grapes need well-drained soils. Uh, grapes can tolerate very high pHs. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, they grow in very calcareous soils, uh, a lot of surface limestones. Um, grapes are rarely affected by frost with regard to fruit set. So they're, they're later to flower, uh, but if you get early spring uh, budding, you can get damage to the entire shoot uh, by cold temperatures. So uh, that can be uh, an issue as well. And of course, uh, grapes are uh, uh, what we call viney, so they require a trellis. So here's just, uh, I, I pulled off some of the uh, commonly recommended uh, grapes for uh, Kentucky. You can see that uh, we have a, a range of, of colors and we also have seedless varieties uh, in some of these as well. And, and so for uh, table use, uh, the seedless varieties are generally uh, much preferred over the seeded varieties. And here's some uh, French American hybrids, again, uh, recommended for Kentucky. Um, you might uh, recognize uh, the names of some of these on some of our Kentucky wines. And grape pruning. So grape pruning can be extremely complex, okay? So uh, my recommendation is that you create a grape arbor or a grape trellis and you prune your vines to fit that trellis. If you study grape pruning, um, you pretty much have to have a calculator to prune grapes because what the recommendations will say is for you to prune off so much wood and then, you know, leave some buds and you weigh the wood and then you leave like uh, 10 buds for the first pound of wood and 20 additional buds for each additional pound of wood. You know, that's for like uh, moderately vigorous cultivars. If it's a vigorous cultivar, you leave 40 buds for the first pound of wood and then 20 buds for each additional pound of wood. So I think for the homeowner, just you know, build your trellis and prune your vines uh, accordingly. Prune them every year, right? Prune them, uh, do some pruning every year, leave some of last year's growth, uh, and I think you'll do okay uh, with grapevine uh, pruning. So a little bit about fertilization. I talked about blueberry fertilization when we were there. Uh, strawberries, uh, generally, you know, well, here's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for obviously, you know, dark green foliage. Uh, we don't want to have leggy growth. And so usually we're using about five pounds of 10, 10, 10 per uh, 100 foot of row. Uh, and we usually do that after flowering. So after, after flowering, even after renovation, just as those uh, uh, stolons and runners are starting to be produced. So having trouble here seeing my entire slide, but it's okay. So uh, blackberries and raspberries, what we want are dark green leaves, you know, good, uh, uh, thick, uh, sturdy growth. 
uh, three quarters to a pound and a half of ammonium nitrate, or as I got at the bottom, uh, urea, uh, a little bit less of urea uh, per hundred foot of row. And we usually do that in the dormant season, so February. And then grapes, what we're looking for in the dormant season are dark brown twigs. And we want uh, last year's twigs to be about three eighths of an inch in diameter, right? So uh, we'll do that in February and about uh, three quarters of a pound of fertilizer per vine. So, uh, so all of these, uh, with the exception of blackberries, we're listing 10, 10, 10. Uh, remember last time I told you that in the absence of a soil test, in Kentucky, we recommend only nitrogen. So you could use ammonium nitrate. Uh, urea is probably more common. So just use a quarter of the rate uh, of urea there uh, as well. Also, uh, for a lot of these plants, if you're doing, if you have these uh, incorporated in your landscape, in your yard, and you're doing regular fertilization of your lawn, then you may not need to fertilize uh, these at all. Let the plant kind of tell you. If it's, you know, getting stunted, stunted or, you know, you're seeing less fruit than usual, then maybe think about uh, doing a little bit of fertilization. But if you're fertilizing them or around them, you may not need to fertilize at all. So any questions on grapes before we go on? And no, not sir. very much left here. We're good on questions right now. Okay, so, you know, we, we said at the beginning that small fruits are good because they generally require less pesticides and things, right? But, but they're not without their problems. So we have wheat issues. We talked about that a little bit already. We can use uh, herbicides, we can use mulch, we can use uh, wheat fabric. Uh, birds and other animals, I, I made clear with the strawberries, you need to have a mechanism to pull netting over those uh, uh, berries. It's the same with blackberries and blueberries. You know, you, you may need to protect your, your uh, plants uh, from animals with netting and, and other devices. Uh, weather, so, uh, you know, it, it may be good to protect your plants at some times when you've got critical, you know, uh, events going on like flowering that may coincide with a frost, right? So with strawberries, that's easy because strawberries are low growing. You lay, uh, you know, a blanket or a tarp over them and that covering helps to trap the heat from the ground, right? But when you have plants that are more upright, that becomes a little more problematic. Some people like to kind of drape their plants you know, with a tarp or a, a blanket or a sheet, right? That does very minimal protection. You, it much better if you drape it then to attach it to the ground around the planting. What you want to happen is the, the warmth that the soil naturally radiates at night to be trapped by your covering, right? If you don't have a connection to the soil, you're not cap capturing that heat. And so you're really not doing much good uh, when you uh, cover your plants. And then insects and disease, right? So uh, I'm gonna uh, show you uh, where you can find a lot of information. Uh, this is our Department of Horticulture uh, website. Uh, the URL there is above. It's just uh, www.uky.edu slash hort, right? And so you see across this top, uh, banner here. We have things like student information, information on research. We have commercial horticulture, home horticulture, crop diversification, right? So those three areas have a lot of growing information for gardeners and producers, right? Now, obviously, if you're a home gardener, most of your information is going to come from home horticulture, but it doesn't mean you won't find other information in those two bookends there, either commercial horticulture or uh, crop diversification. So if you hit home horticulture, then what you get uh, is our publications divided up into topic areas. So first they're gonna be divided up into flowers, fruit, houseplants, landscapes, what have you. 
And then we've got some turf graph information that we bring over from plant and soil science. But, and I think what you all would, would look at, you know, would be fruit. So I can, uh, well, if my mouse would work, I could go there, let's see. Here we go. So we'll go over there and take a look, right? So here's that home page, and we'll go to home horticulture. And so we're talking about fruit tonight. So we'll go to fruit. And so generally the first bunch of publications are things about, you know, getting started. Hey, you know, hey, hey, hey Rick, uh, if you're yes. showing the website, it's not showing up. Oh, I'm sorry. It's because I'm not sharing the right thing. Here. Now we're there. Good. Now can you see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. we're good now. Okay, so let's go back then. Here's so here's the home page. Well, no, here's the home page, and we got home horticulture and then commercial horticulture crop diversification. So we're going to go to home horticulture and all the different subjects here. You know, last week we talked about vegetables. Lots of information here on vegetables, and we'll go to fruit. Right. So in fruit. Um, Getting started, so um, bird netting, right? Uh, fertility guides, uh, home fruit in uh, central Ohio, uh, insect problems, so kind of general publications are here. Then we scroll down, we've got publications on tree fruits. So we didn't talk about those tonight, but we talked about small fruits. So, you know, here's a lot of, information on small fruits. Some of these are specific, you know, grapes. Uh, here's the orange rust of brambles, which the question came, you know, tonight. I bet if you clicked on that, you would find which fungicide you use to control orange roost, uh, rust and brambles, right? So you get the picture here. Lots of good information, uh, pest management specific things here. Uh, so uh, something to take a look at, right? And you know, your, your county agent, can you assist you with this as well? You know, so um, when you ask them a question, if they don't know that right away, this is probably where they're going to find the answer, I would guess. So, so anyway, I think that's uh, where I'll end. Uh, any uh, other questions or anything tonight? Yes, sir, it, here's one. If you have your lawn sprayed for weeds, do you need to keep a distance from your fruiting plants? If so, what distance do you recommend? So I think it depends on how strong the wind is blowing that day, right? Um, you, you need to be as far away as you can be and not allow drift onto uh, you know, your, your desirable plants. Um, so, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the, the lawn companies, if you look at them, the way they apply chemicals, they apply it as, uh, as really like they're watering the lawn, right? And that's good because when they're watering the lawn, there's not a lot of little droplets that are going, you know, hither and yon uh, to get on things that you don't want to get on. So, uh, you know, it, it's really, it's, it's variable. You, if, it's, if it's windy, don't spray. Uh, if it's not windy, spray, but just make sure that you're not allowing any drift to grow, go over onto um, your, your plants. That's got our questions for right now. It's been some good questions tonight. Yeah. A uh, couple of reminders tomorrow, or sorry, not tomorrow. Next week is about uh, annual perennials in the landscape at starting at 630 again. I will email you all the, the YouTube link for the recording uh, in case you want to come back and review it. So we will have it posted up there and I will email you the links that uh, Rick went over with you on the, the home horticulture websites and stuff like that. I'll pencil me in for the 18th on wildlife control. We will do our very best. I was talking with uh, Dr. Springer this afternoon and he was 90% sure that he was open. So we, I just need to confirm up with him when he got back in front of his calendar. So we will get that taken care of. 
And like Rick said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your county agent. Um, we are always looking forward to talking with each and every one of you. Uh, I do have the slides for the day's presentation. They should have went out in an email, but I will attach them tomorrow as well. Other than that, I don't have anything except for one shameless plug. Uh, when I send you the YouTube link, if you don't care to hit that subscribe button, and then once me and Macy get so many subscribes, we can change it and actually get a decent uh, web address. That's not a bunch of rambled numbers. So if you don't care to hit that subscribe button, I would appreciate that. Other than that, uh, we will get to the wildlife control. I will email you officially once I talk to Dr. Springer, if we will have it. But like I said, keep me penciled in for the 18th. If no other questions, uh, everybody have a great night. Stay safe. Uh, enjoy that wonderful sunshine that was out today and it's going to be out tomorrow. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank thanks. you very much. We, I enjoyed the session. It was good. Can I ask one question?